Well, hello again. Can everybody hear me? Um, here's my long title, playing on the theme of yesterday and today. Um, my contention is that a lot of data has been recorded over the last 150 or more years. Much of it is very relevant to today's interests and problems, uh, as I'll try to show uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's appropriate, as David did, to begin with Emil Howery uh, and in the modern generation of the study of Hoakam archaeology. Uh, here he's chatting with David Gregory, uh, one of our other colleagues now past, who also made tremendous contributions to Hoakam archaeology. All of us seek to stand on their shoulders and try not to kick them in the teeth as we get on the board. That's what scholarship is about. Uh, is trying to see further than those who have come before us. Uh, I like to begin, though, thinking about Holocom archaeology uh, with Eusebio Kino, a Jesuit priest and geographer, uh, who in the 1690s described the Casa Grande ruins, putting it on the map of, of European cognitive world uh, and beginning to the questioning about uh, what the, the, these remains mean, uh, how to understand them uh, in a larger historical context. Um, it was in 1931, however, uh, at Gila Pueblo, a place founded by a man named Harold Gladwin, that a Southwest Archaeology Conference was held and a consensus was formed uh, by Gladwin and uh, his new assistant director, Emil Howery, that the term Hoakam uh, could be adopted and used to describe a, a distinct cultural tradition in the American Southwest Already in 1927 at, at Pecos Pueblo, uh, a, a sequence of cultural development had been, had been defined, but it applied uh, really only to the Colorado Plateau and the northern southwest, not uh, in the basin and range province in the south to the southwest. And Gladwin had by this time made the case uh, for its distinctness and, and um, a consensus formed. They then continued uh, to define it uh, from there on out now in the uh, Gila Valley, uh, we have a number of sites. I'm gonna talk about two. Casa Grande here, where Kino first uh, visited in the 1690s, uh, and then Snake Town up here, as David mentioned, uh, where Howery uh, uh, excavated the site for Harold Gladwin in the 1930s, and then later came back in the 1960s in a second expedition that was published in 1976. So these are two key sites uh, in this region. Uh, here's a, a view of the Casa Grande here. It still stood in the late 19th century. Uh, many, many visitors had come here since Kino's time and described it. And one of them was Adolf Bandelier uh, in uh, the 1880s. And later, Jesse Walter Fuchs uh, did excavations there and published a large monograph reviewing many of those travelers' accounts uh, and providing his own interpretations uh, of the site. Uh, here we see a map uh, stolen from Archaeology Southwest, for those who know that journal. Uh, uh, here we have uh, what Fuchs called Compound A with the Casa Grande, a four-story structure here, uh, a ball court here, and a Compound B with two small platform mounds in it here. Uh, and here's uh, another map of the same site. One is Bandeliers, one is Fuchs uh, drawing. However, it was Frank Hamilton Cushing uh, in 1888, who was the director at, at the time of the Hemingway Southwest Archaeological Expedition on behalf of Mary Hemingway of Boston. Uh, he came on a reconnaissance over to the Casa Grande ruins and was quite excited uh, by what he saw there. He thought he could transfer his uh, work to that site. He, uh, he persuaded Mary Hemingway to petition Congress to have it set aside by the federal government. Uh, she sent him to Washington, D.C., uh, in early 1889, and they were successful in doing that, the first prehistoric site in the nation uh, to be saved uh, for posterity. Uh, she previously had helped save Old South Church in Boston, uh, and so I think uh, one of the first historic sites in America to be saved in this way. I think it's fair to say she was the godmother of, of American historic preservation. Uh, Cushing, looking at the Casa Grande and its layout, uh, was reminded of uh, Zuni uh, cornfields, which he had studied. He'd lived at Zuni for several years, learned the language, and was applying this knowledge to try to interpret the archaeological past. 
Uh, and in the outline of the Casa Grande, he thought he saw a similar structure of symbolic uh, relationships uh, and uh, was one of the first then to provide a, a symbolic interpretation of this very interesting four-story building. Um, Cosmos Mendeleev was sent out by the Bureau of Ethnology in the 1890s to help stabilize the ruin, and uh, he did through this map at the time. Uh, later studies uh, of the building, there are holes through some of the walls in the building, uh, and a man named John Malloy, who was a graduate student at the University of Arizona at the time, uh, did an archaeoastronomy study of the building uh, and argued that many uh, significant uh, astronomical events could be observed through these holes. Uh, I myself cannot evaluate these claims, but think that further replication is needed uh, to further test them. However, in 1976, the Arizona State Museum had a contract with the National Park Service to make an architectural study of the building, uh, and an archaeologist named Lynette Schenk and I uh, were sent there to do that. Uh, we did elevation drawings of the interior walls of the building, and some of those holes uh, that uh, Malloy talks about are shown here. Uh, we could argue uh, that they were design features of the building. Uh, they were built when the walls were built, uh, is one of the conclusions we reached. Uh, another uh, of his drawings here. Another finding that we made uh, in a report uh, that I wrote that turned out to be my dissertation at the University of Arizona uh, was that the building was all built as one continuous construction event. Uh, they built up the lower walls to a level and then filled it in, and then took up the second story, built the roofs, took it up to the third story, built the roofs, and then in the center, a fourth story. Uh, all at one time, there are no true abutments uh, in this structure. There's some cracks that are probably uh, drying cracks, not abutments. Um, uh, now, in uh, my dissertation, I had a chance uh, in early 1977 uh, to review what was known about Hoakam archaeology at that time. Linda Mayrow, who was the, the project director, forced me into writing a chapter on culture history, uh, which I didn't think was needed, but the so Park Service wanted it. So I took a month off on my own dime and I read all the literature of Holocaust archaeology at that time in 1976 and 7. And nobody can do that today. And uh, I synthesized it in this chapter. And so I had the chance to be the first to uh, systematically evaluate Emil Howery's recent work at Snake Town, his newly published book, uh, and uh, made a number of arguments uh, about that. Uh, that I'll get into in a bit here. Here again, we see where Snake Town is, uh, three miles west of Gila Butte, where I-10 today goes by uh, right through here. Um, this is what it looked like at the site, uh, out in the Sonoran Desert, Gila Butte there uh, to the east. Uh, here we have the original crew at Snake Town with Emil Howery on the, your left. Uh, and Fisher Motts here is the, the cartographer for the expedition, which I'll talk a bit about in a minute. Uh, as David mentioned, they developed uh, basic sequences of architectural change through time at this site, especially they added what they called the pioneer period to what Gladwin had already called the colonial, sedentary, and classic periods, which are a succession then of cultural change through time. Uh, and at Snake Town, they added uh, a great deal of information about the earliest time uh, in this area. Uh, and uh, they had pottery types as well uh, that were defined uh, in, a, in a sequence here. Um, now, soon after publication in 1937 of their report, uh, Harold Gladwin began to have doubts about uh, the A.E. Douglas tree ring uh, method. Uh, which had been used to date pottery in the, on the northern uh, southwest in the Colorado Plateau. Pottery that was found, types of pottery that was found at Snake Town and had been used to construct the chronology. Uh, and so he published uh, a critique uh, of the chronology that, that Howery had principally taken the responsibility for. Um, and he did have, a, however, you can see a sense of humor about it, uh, which is more than I can say as the son of Gladwin, we'll get into later. Um, this man, uh, uh, Al Schroeder, uh, was a student of Howery, did a master's thesis under him in 1940, uh, did extensive stratigraphic studies in the Salt River Valley of, of large trash mounds, and his findings supported the general sequence uh, seen at Snake Town. Howery had reconstructed it 
uh, but he uh, thought that at the beginning of the colonial period, uh, people had probably come in from Mexico and were responsible for uh, major changes that occurred at that time. Uh, another student of Howery, Charles de Peso, in a dissertation in 1953, uh, also, uh, uh, and later also argued along these lines. Uh, Howery then, listening to all of this and other critiques, uh, bided his time until he could retire as the chairman of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Arizona and the director of the Arizona State Museum, at which point he got a National Science Foundation grant to go back to Snake Town and try to get new data to resolve many of these controversies. And his book uh, in 1976 then addressed those issues. Uh, and uh, um, at the time, uh, in 1976, he argued himself that the beginning of the Snake Town sequence had, had started with a migration from Mexico. Uh, uh, he showed, though, that there was continuity from the pioneer period into the colonial period. Uh, and so he discounted the theories of his former students about that. Now, this afternoon, we'll hear from Henry Wallace a new interpretation of those same data and that transition from the pioneer to the colonial and a new kind of an, a way of thinking about what explains uh, all of that data that many of these people knew very well. Uh, they just had a, a different take on what, what might account for it. Um, now, today, um, uh, we've learned a lot more uh, about the antecedents to Snake Town. In my dissertation, I argued against Howry's view, uh, arguing in favor of an earlier view he had that, that the whole, what we call the Hoacom sequence had emerged out of earlier uh, archaic occupations in the Southwest. Uh, and um, today, uh, there's been magnificent discoveries in the Tucson Basin and elsewhere in the Southwest that show that agriculture of farming uh, goes back another 2,000 years from what we knew only a little while ago. Uh, and there are new theories uh, about how to explain how it first came into the Southwest. And guess what? Some of them involve people from Mesoamerica intruding into the Southwest, uh, including uh, in this excellent book by Peter Bellwood about first farmers worldwide and a general theory about that. The, the linguist Jane Hill has taken up some of Bellwood's ideas and has a similar idea that Udo Aztecan speakers uh, came into the Southwest about 4,000 years ago, bringing corn agriculture uh, in at that time. Uh, now, many of us would argue against that theory, thinking it still is diffusion from the, from the uh, Mesoamerica into the Southwest, that it was the, the plants that moved, not the people. And so that's a current debate. In some ways, it's a reiteration of old debates in, in, new, in new clothing. Kind of interesting that way. Um, here is one of the sites in the Tucson Basin uh, where these very small structures, but with ubiquitous with corn maize uh, in them, that date into the early centuries uh, bef before AD, uh, before Christ, back as early now as 4,100 or more years ago. And if you're uh, members of the Center for Desert Archaeology and get Archaeology Southwest, uh, you'll have a, a very good summary of a lot of this information that they have been putting out very regularly. Um, as Dave mentioned, uh, um, the Hohokam chronology now has become quite complex. When Howery went back to Snake Town, he tried to find as many samples, carbon-14 samples, as he could to date the earliest uh, occupation in the pioneer period. Uh, and he published that data in his book. Uh, when I looked at it, however, uh, I argued that as probability statements, carbon-14 dating, uh, that he, the sample that he had drawn didn't really support going back to 300 BC, which is what they had originally postulated in, in the 1930s. Uh, Howry reiterated that view. Uh, but um, when you look at the, the data actually that he had, uh, and understand the, the, the nature of probability statements. It didn't really support a chronology. What that became called the long chronology. You may have noticed that in one of Dave's slides. And instead, I show that it probably didn't begin until the early centuries AD. Uh, uh, now, others then soon joined the argument and, and added other uh, uh, ideas about that. Michael Schiffer famously pointed out that, that when you uh, have wood in the desert, it can be very old. Uh, before you build something with it, uh, you get a carbon-14 date from old wood. It can be skewed hundreds of years too early. Um, 
And so this too then tended to support the notion of a, of a shorter chronology. And many more data though have now come to, to bear. Uh, and if you can squint real good, you can see that, that this is what, uh, I think this is a chart that Henry Wallace put together. And uh, we see uh, in here the beginnings of what Howry called the pioneer period. Uh, they've now shifted as far forward as AD, nearly to AD 500. Uh, which is even later than I was arguing at the time. So we've shortened the chronology that crunches up a lot of the other information that was still there. The, the order, though, I think has been maintained quite well uh, in all of these findings. Uh, here's uh, Fisher Motts, not at Snake Town, but at Wapaki, which he also mapped in the 1930s. I love this picture. Uh, this is the map of Snake Town that he drew in the 1930s. And he shows 60 what were thought of as trash mounds, these mounds here. Uh, now here is a feature that Emil Howery in the 30s argued was a ball court, analogous to ball courts found in Mexico, although it was made of earth and it was oval, not made of stone and rectangular, which is true in Mexico. So there's also a small one here, a smaller court uh, here. And each of these uh, increments here, this is 60 meters. Uh, so this is quite a large site. Uh, this ball court was, what, 33 by 66 meters, something like that, 90 meters, I can't quite remember, very long anyway. Now, in um, uh, 1980, uh, I had a chance, again, for the Arizona State Museum to do a survey, intensive survey at Snake Town, uh, and part of that we proposed an archival study, uh, and the maps that we produced from that are scanned here to show you the data that Howery had assembled both in the 1930s and the 1960s. Um, I want to point out then this one contour where there, there was nothing found, as we argued it was a central plaza at this site. Uh, here we see it again. We come up with a site structure concept then uh, in this way. And even the earliest houses at Snake Town point in toward this central plaza. And Dave Doyle and a colleague also went further with this to show that that pattern persisted for some time. Uh, Henry Wallace now has excavated a site in the Tucson Basin, which replicates this basic pattern with a central plaza and these really large early, early buildings pointing in toward it. Uh, replication of this kind is really important in science to see that a pattern is really a pattern. At Snake Town, uh, I looked at the dating of the trash mounds that they had and found that the earliest occupation was more center where it's hatched there, and then it grew through time in a, basically a concentric fashion. Now, more recently, uh, uh, Doug Craig uh, at a nearby site of Gru, which is really part of the early part of Casa Grande ruin, uh, used a different approach to digging the site than Howry had. Howry did use trenches, but then he dug features, he dug pit houses, whereas Doug Craig used trenches, but then he stripped and he stripped and down and stripped down and stripped down and stripped down. As he did that, he kept finding more and more and more and more pit houses. Now, Dave Abbott and I had looked at Howry's data uh, and uh, had thought that maybe there were, there were no more than about 300 people at Snake Town at its height, uh, based on some statistical kinds of considerations. But it depended on what Howry had found. And if what Doug Craig's findings are, are applicable to Snake Town as well, uh, it now appears that the size of the population was perhaps three times as large or more uh, at its height, more like 900,000 people even, uh, which is a very significant difference, uh, if true. Um, I also uh, looked at the relationship of houses to one another in the Snake Town uh, reanalysis, and I noticed a pattern of adjacent houses of the same phase or time period had doorways that pointed toward a common focus. That was an empirical pattern that repeated and repeated. Here's one case where you see a series of these kinds of, of uh, relationships. And I argued that those, uh, those house groups uh, were probably significant as what we generally call households. Uh, Jerry Howard later called them courtyard groups, which is a term I think has been much more widely used. Uh, we also found, though, as Dave showed in one of his figures, uh, that sets of these uh, co-occur in clusters. They often have their own 
cremation, bur secondary burial area associated with them, sometimes also earth ovens and so on too. Uh, and they look like uh, probably then super household groups which had their own identity within these Hoakam villages. Uh, and in fact, in a number of cases, we can see that super household clusterings like that occur about every 100 meters or 200 meters along a canal at some sites. Uh, and so this is a second level of social organization that we're able to infer uh, from uh, the, the patterning in the, the way houses and, and domestic arrangements were organized in these villages. Uh, Dave's example from the Escalani site of a platform mound shows a super household uh, 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 clustered on top of that, uh, which I think argues for uh, the, the, those platform, those later platform mounds being places of habitation, not simply ceremony. Uh, I'm rattling some cages here you may hear about later. So. Um, now at Snake Town, at Snake Town, Howry found a ball court. Uh, as we mentioned, 1985, Vernon Scarborough and I organized an international symposium on the Mesoamerican ball game and argued that the uh, ball game, not the ball court, diffused from Mexico uh, at that time. Uh, there are now about 200 of them known. Here's one at Ridge Ruin. Uh, here's the distribution of them uh, in the Southwest, Hoakam ball courts at Wapaki being the northernmost one here. Uh, the, the Chaco system over here, the member system here, shell exchange routes uh, coming into the Southwest. Um, the magician burial in Flagstaff dates in the late 1100s, it looks like, and uh, he had with him a, uh, an object like this, a raptorial bird of shell with turquoise uh, mosaic around it. Uh, contemporaneous in Flagstaff, they're toads like this. These were found, however, at Casa Grande Ruins in 1906. Uh, here we have a profile drawn in 1906. Uh, they were in a cluster, probably in a medicine bag, as with other turquoise and so on. They used to have these on display at Casa Grande Ruins. Some of you may have seen them at that uh, at one time. They're not on display anymore. Uh, there are about 59 of those objects that I know about in the Southwest. I think they're emblems of office, uh, and uh, I think that they indicate a kind of dual social organization, uh, a raptorial bird being a sky creature, the toad, an earth creature, uh, perhaps also then symbols of the sun and the moon. Uh, and uh, I think that kind of dual organization probably informed how these ceremony, these irrigation systems were organized in the Salt River Valley and the, and the Gila Valley uh, in, in the past. The colors here are where there are platform mound sites along the salt. I, I wanna quickly talk about two sites, Pobo Grande here uh, and Los Hornos uh, here. Uh, again, Frank Cushing was there in 1887, and at Pueblo Grande, he, he excavated this structure. Uh, the first floor was filled in. It has at least two, maybe three stories high, uh, probably three stories high. Uh, had a hearth in the upper level there that you can see here that he documented. These are roof beam holes here. Um, this is the first Holcom structure to be professionally excavated in any sense. Uh, it looks like it's a tower like the Casa Grande. Uh, there's another one uh, indicated at another site called La Ciudad in the Phoenix Basin. It could be there were a number of these structures beyond the one we know the most about at Casa Grande. Other people who worked here were Joshua Miller. Around 1901, he dug a tunnel into the Pueblo Grande Mound. Here we see Omar Turney, uh, self-styled city archaeologist of, of Phoenix, uh, looking into that tunnel. He invited a man named Eric Schmidt to come down to the valley uh, from work he was doing up around Roosevelt Lake uh, for the American Museum of Natural History. Schmidt dug two stratigraphic uh, test pits, at, one at, at La Ciudad and one at Pueblo Grande. He went back to Columbia University and, and did a dissertation then on that, the first dissertation in Hohokam studies. Uh, and what he found was that at the top of the sequence, what later was called the classic period, uh, Gila polychrome was found, whereas earlier there was red and buff pottery and one seemed to displace the other. And very cautiously, he proposed that this was a significant pattern. And Ira Gladwin came along uh, uh, in 1930 and radicalized that idea into a, an idea of people they called the Salado or Pueblo people coming into the valley. Uh, Emil Howery in his dissertation at Harvard advocated that theory uh, using the collections made by Cushing at, in the Salt River Valley uh, that he wrote up for his dissertation. 
Uh, now later his student, David Doyle, uh, would do some excavations and find other data to show the continuity through the classic period into the time when helipolychrome came into the valley, uh, argue against Howry's view that uh, there was any kind of Salado invasion. Uh, now today we have a new version of some of these ideas. Our friend Patrick Lyons, uh, uh, who now works there as in a state museum, has made a study of these objects, uh, which are, uh, have holes around a rim, a shallow a bowl-like thing. They, they seem to be early form of a wheel to make pottery, or what the Hopi call a puki. And uh, uh, Patrick makes a strong argument that in many cases they're associated with assemblages that look like they're intruding populations of Kayan Anasazi down into the uh, San Pedro Valley, for example. Uh, but a number of these objects are also found in the Salt River Valley, I'm told, in Perry Mesa, north of there. One has been found recently. And I think, though, that to argue too strongly that this is in indicative of a migration by Pueblo people, as Patrick seems to be doing, uh, can be said to be an argument that's a little thin and full of holes. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't see why they couldn't have been trading these things. Uh, they're they're apparently technological gizmos, and uh, uh, we'll see. Now, at Pueblo Grande, this man, Julian Hayden, excavated in the 1930s, and Chris Downham here uh, has now written up a great deal of the work that Julian and others did. He made this model of Pueblo Grande, uh, which, again, to my eye, looks much more like uh, household occupations, super household group on top of the mound. Uh, this is how the site of Los Hornos looked when I first saw it in 1979. It was called Casa de Loma by, by uh, Turney, but also called Los Hornos by Cushing. Uh, and Jerry Howard, uh, seen here very thin at that time, I was very thin too, uh, uh, found in the Hayden Library an itinerary, part of an itinerary by Cushing about his time at the site of Los Hornos. And we wondered what the site looked like at that time. Uh, and eventually I was able to find the data for that, and Jerry uh, was able to make a map, uh, this map, uh, that shows that it was a 480-acre site. We had only a 60-acre area, uh, which was trenched. We documented, though, a 1,000 features here, and because of that, uh, we were able to prevail on federal agencies to think that there was significant remains still under the urban landscape in Phoenix, and that millions of dollars should be spent to recover information about them. Uh, which then did begin to happen uh, uh, following this, this time. We, however, at Los Hornos only had $50,000 to work with, not a million and a half, regrettably. <laughs> um, we were able, however, like uh, Fisher Motts had done at Snake Town, eventually to reconstruct uh, a, a comprehensive view of what the, whole, what the Los Hornos site looked like, how it was related to its, its larger uh, ecology, uh, in, in the settlement landscape that it was a part of. Uh, and thus, as we do more work at these sites, we can begin to look at the relationship of the part to the whole and understand uh, how the little bits of data we're able to get now uh, can be applied to much larger problems. Uh, in a place called uh, uh, Perry Mesa, I uh, recorded all known sites, 13 rooms or larger. That led to a study of all of the American Southwest uh, and a coalescent communities database, as uh, we've called it. Uh, and when you boil this down, one of the findings is that the Salt River Valley is the largest place demographically in the whole North American Southwest uh, for about 200 years, more than anywhere else, and nowhere else lasted that long. Uh, uh, it also leads to ideas about uh, population. Uh, Jerry and I taking Los Hornos as a measuring stick argue there were at its peak 12 to 15,000 people in the valley. Uh, when Dave talks about kings, he may not be far wrong. Uh, uh, 2,500 to 3,500 people has been taken as a cutoff point, uh, where after that, more complexity is found. Comparative studies before that, not so much. But if there were 10 or 15,000 people in the Salt River Valley, that's way beyond that, that magic number of 2,500 to 3,500. And with that, I'm going to stop. <laughs>